Fears of further unrest in Bangladesh. As the Prime Minister goes ahead with an election many say should be delayed. The opposition's boycotting the poll, saying the process is a farce. But is all this driven by politics or personal hatred between two political leaders? Where does that lead the rest of Bangladesh's 150 million people? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme with me, David Foster. Bangladesh heads to the polls on Sunday. Opposition parties are boycotting the vote after Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina refused to make way for a neutral caretaker government which could have overseen the elections. Questions are now being asked about the credibility of Sunday's poll without opposition participation. The ruling Awami League's guaranteed to win more than half of the 300 seats available. Supporters of the opposition have fought with security forces in Dhaka and they continue to take to the streets defying a police ban. The leader of the main opposition party has even called for a march to protest against what she calls a farcical election. But the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has said this, we've tried our best to bring the BNP into the elections. She, Khaled Azia, spurned my offer for dialogue and instead chose the path of confrontation. She's held the people to hostage in the name of strikes and blockades. Well, the two women and their deep political rivalry have cast a long shadow over Bangladeshi politics. Prime Minister Hasina and her rival, the former Prime Minister Khaled Azir, are both battling to be the next leader. Well, they head up the two most powerful parties, Hasina the Awami League and Zia the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. They were not always political enemies. In 1990, they actually joined forces to bring down the dictatorial rule of Hussein Mohammed Ershad. But since then, they've become bitter competitors as power has shifted between the two parties. Well, due to campaigning laws in Bangladesh, we can't speak to anybody from the government or the opposition, but let's bring in those guests that we do have. Very glad to have you with us in Dhaka, Dilara Chowdhury, professor at North South University and author of the book Constitutional Development in Bangladesh, Stresses and Strains. In London, we find Kailash Budwa, a South Asia analyst, and joining us on Skype from Dhaka, Imtiaz Ahmed, Professor of International Relations at the University of Dhaka. Welcome to you all. Dilara Chowdhury, let me come to you first. I want to put aside for the moment the rivalry between uh, Sheikh Hasina um, and her opposite number and ask you, when it comes to political beliefs, what are the values of the BNP on one side and the Awami League on the other? How different are they? Uh, basically, basically there are not that uh, dif th there are not th that much differences between these two political parties. Awami League, which stands for uh, the nationalism, for Awami League, the Bangladesh nationalism is based on Bengali ethnicity, culture, and Bengali uh, literature. But uh, BNP's uh, nationalism is based on the geography of Bangladesh uh, and some connotation of uh, uh, some con or some some connotation of religion into it, but uh, basically, you know, when it comes to economic policy, social policies, or political uh, uh, decisions, there are not that much differences between these two political parties. So, Kailash, let, let me ask you this: if um, as we've just heard from Dilara, that there isn't a great deal in terms of ideology between these two parties. Why are they so far apart? Why is politics in Bangladesh so poisonous? In the history, 42 years short history of Bangladesh, these two ladies have dominated the political scene for nearly 24 years. It has been known as a battle of the two Begums. Sheikh Hasina and Begum Zia. The most unfortunate part in this battle is that though both of them believe in democracy, both of them believe in democratic rights of the people for them to vote and elect a government, but they never see eye to eye how to 
मेक इट वर्क शेख हसीना इन लास्ट इलेक्शन वन ओवर एट्टी परसेंट सीट्स इन पार्लियामेंट अनफॉर्चुनेटली देन बेगम जिया डिसाइडेड नॉट टू गो टू पार्लियामेंट और नॉट टू लेट हर पार्टी सिट इन पार्लियामेंट ऑन ए वेरी ट्रिवियल मैटर ऑफ सीटिंग अरेंजमेंट अगेन नाउ वाइल बोथ ऑफ देम हैव ए चांस टू प्रूव देयर मेंटल टू गो टू द पीपल एंड विन ए मैंडेट बोथ ऑफ देम आर इट लॉगर हेड्स to see that their own view point prevails which is very unfortunate because it's an open opportunity for both these parties to go to polls to ask the people who do they want to govern and so, then so so th there there you the have result. there you have um, one party leader saying i'm not going to join your parliament because i don't like where you're going to make me sit uh, we had just a couple of months ago the two leaders uh, recorded Uh, talking to each other on the phone and arguing about why the phones weren't working, why one wasn't picking up the other phone. So give us an idea why these two women, who were friends at one point, why they have come to distrust and dislike each other so much. It, it's this way, in, till 1990, after the coup in 1975, for nearly 15 years, it was the army which prevailed. In 1990, the two ladies joined hands to dislodge the army and to bring it back the politics to political parties. Though it's known as a battle of the two Begums, but now they totally differ in their approach, and Begum Zia has now started resorting to take help from religious factions. And once you inject religion into politics, it's the most lethal combination. while begum zia stands with her support from the jamaat e islami which is basically a fundamentalist party the party representing awami league of course a horse religion it's a secular party and the battle has now become not between the two begums it has become the secular forces in bangladesh and the forces which want to resort to so, so kind of politics Yeah, let, let me ask Imtiaz Ahmed in that case, if it is no longer just about uh, the Battle of the Begums as it's been described and it's now about forces within each party, um, how powerful are those forces? Because we're going to see an election and the result of which will be that the Awami League is in control of the government. How well equipped and how strong are the forces on the opposing side to counter that? Well, I think it's uh, more complex uh, than uh, the previous speakers uh, have highlighted. Uh, two particular things uh, ought to be flagged. Uh, one is the political business nexus, uh, which is uh, very important. So, whichever party is in power uh, actually has 200% uh, in its pocket, and that's very important. And it's not only political business nexus; it's also political business bureaucracy. next next so you are having the pie uh, almost 200% and if you are not in power you are minus 200% almost so that's uh, enormous power so you can if you are in power you can do uh, whatever you like uh, you know make money if you want to uh, promote anyone you want to and if you are not in power then you can't do anything of that kind so one is the nexus and the second one which is also very complicated is the issue of family oppression Uh, there are two families uh, involved, and uh, I think uh, both have an idea that the one is trying to wipe out the other. You know, whether it's 1975 uh, killing uh, or later on uh, you know, when Zia Rahman was, uh, you know, uh, assassinated. So you know, uh, both the killing actually are blamed somehow on uh, the other. So it's an issue of family oppression plus the nexus, which has. Uh, complicated uh, the whole process, and then you have uh, uh, layers of psycho fans actually uh, who would be uh, promoting uh, one or the other because they know that only by promoting the other uh, they have a chance to remain uh, in in that nexus and uh, profit from it. So it, it and, is, and is indeed the the, the, the poison the poison is, is so much that uh, Sheikh Hasina's 
uh, said she may well prosecute Khaled Azir after the election. She's had her evicted from her house. There are accusations of money laundering going on. But this, this is right at the top of the tree. I, I would like to ask Dilara now. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of an extremely low turnout. Um, in the country, partly because more than 150 seats are effectively already booked to the Awami League because the opposition is boycotting those, so people can't see any point in voting. Well, in fact, in those constituents, there will be no vote. But in the other ones, they're looking at an extremely low turnout. Is it the Awami League and the BNP that people are turning their back on, or do they just have no faith that Bangladesh's political elite are leading them in any sort of the right direction? Well, basically, you see, uh, you, you started with, you know, the mistrust between the two political parties. Uh, whereas, you know, you also said, and which is right, which is correct, that they join hand in trying, when they tried to bring down the military ruler, uh, uh, Ishad. Uh, but the whole thing, actually, you know, and Bangladesh, there were great hopes that uh, now that the, with the emergence of two nascent political parties, uh, we are going to start having um, um, uh, a uh, democratic process, continued democratic process in the country. But from the beginning, uh, when parliamentary system was reintroduced in the country, the politics between these two parties actually centered around power how to grab the power and how to remain in power. That became the main issue between the two political parties. And when you talk about, uh, we know that in politics, you know, that there are uh, uh, political expediency. But here, both Awami League and BNP, because of the strike and mistrust against each other, because they considered themselves or each other as the main contender for power. So the fight is between, basically between these two political parties. And do the people themselves and feel completely let down by this, un unable to effect result, any kind of change? Both political parties, uh, it, has, it has become very difficult, it is become difficult to bring about a change uh, uh, because there are no internal democracies within these political parties. So the same person is the leader of the uh, house and also the leader of the party, ruling party, and same goes for BNP. So without having a democratic uh, democracy within the political parties, none of these are leaders, are challenged within the parties, number one. Number two, in our constitution, there is an article which is Article 17, and this prohibits the parliament members from voting against the party which has nominated that person for the election. And so, in a sense, it is it's, it's, it's uncontrolled power. As a result, um, th th there are not enough see, checks and balances, perhaps. In um, in, in the views of the, the people bound up in, in the constitution, not enough checks and balances. But, but, I, but I want, right, I, right. I'm going to move on just a second. I, I'm wondering where some of the other political forces come in, uh, notably Jamaat e Islami, uh, which would like to see an Islamist government in Bangladesh. And we, we've seen a senior member of that, Abdul Qadir Mullah, um, executed for war crimes a short while ago. Let, let me go to Kailash now and um, ask you, Kailash. Where do you think uh, Jamaat -e Islami, for example, and, and other uh, minority parties, where will they have any kind of say in Bangladesh's future? Jamaat -e Islami on its own is a totally different case because, after all, at the time of birth of Bangladesh, more than millions of lives were lost. And at that time, Bangladesh emerged as a secular democratic country. Now, Jamaat Islami is trying to inject religion back into rural areas where there are lots of people who are illiterate. And it's trying to play up the religious sentiment. It's trying to attack religious feelings of people, which is very, very unfortunate in a modern society. In a country like Bangladesh, which has the potential 
to become a very affluent and rich country. Well, we, there have been instances like the textile factory disaster where more than 1,100 lives are lost. Next door in Burma, there are Rohingya Bangladeshis who are on their own and nobody can help them. And therefore, instead of fighting for power like the jamaat e islami wants to come in and mind you jamaat e islami has never won any election anywhere not even in pakistan therefore jamaat e islami resorts to violence jamaat e islami resorts to chaos which of course stops the democratic process what people in bangladesh have to realize between these two political parties, there should be an open ground. Here is an opportunity for them to fight out election, to prove their mettle, to go to people and ask for a mandate. And whosoever wins has, of course, the power to run the country. And that is how it should be done. Luckily, Bangladesh is a democratic country. Luckily, there is an opportunity to ask the people to give their mandate. And there is no reason why these two political parties shouldn't go to the polls, fight it out, and see who wins. Let, let me ask Imtiaz Ahmed here, broadening it out just, just a little bit here, from internal Bangladeshi politics to the way that the international community views what goes on in, in this country. Um, India, for example, who would it most like to see running Bangladesh, where are its interests best looked after? Well, uh, at this uh, moment, I think even Delhi is uh, quite uh, uh, confused. Uh, uh, confused uh, mainly because uh, it, uh, it backed AL for quite some time. It backed Awamili, no doubt. Uh, but the very fact that uh, in uh, more than, uh, well, in 153, seats, uh, there's no election, not a single vote being cast. Uh, uh, to put it differently, over 50% of the people uh, or the voters are not being able uh, to vote. I think this situation, this new situation uh, has created a problem for Delhi because out of 40 political parties, only 12 political parties are participating. So it is not only BNP, even pro-71 Liberation War, uh, pro-Liberation War parties like uh, Communist Party of Bangladesh, Dr. Kamal Hussain's party, Kadeh Siddiqui's party, uh, he's a freedom fighter, former freedom fighter. So uh, they're also boycotting the election. So that has become a, a serious problem uh, for Delhi. So only in the last, I think, in 72 hours, there has been uh, a little bit of shift in the sense that now they are calling for dialogue and saying that uh, uh, all uh, should vote and you know all those uh, lines are coming but I guess it's, it's a little bit late and uh, but uh, late for 5th January election but I'm sure right after 5th January they probably will join the international community uh, the European Union the USA the UN uh, which have been talking for dialogue uh, you know uh, for quite some time and, and have actually been very critical the way uh, things were going, particularly uh, the no compromise kind of a situation on the part of the government. You, 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 so talk about, I, I, you, you talk about the international community. It's a strange phrase, isn't it? But here we have the European Union. Uh, we have the United States refusing to send election observers in here, ostensibly uh, because they don't believe it is, it's a fair and just process. Exactly. So, so where would they be in dealing uh, with the Awami League, headed once again by Sheikh Hasina, when it is at her insistence in, in, in many ways that this unjust position um, has occurred? Uh, I guess uh, uh, on, the, on 6 January uh, they will uh, keep repeating what they have been saying and, and they will uh, use the word dialogue uh, once again. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, she is going to get a blanket congratulation, uh, congratulatory note. Uh, so one thing will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, insistence on dialogue that will come. And uh, I guess uh, they can uh, bring other cards as well. There are several cards, but I'm not really sure at, uh, at what stage they are going to use those cards. Uh, they will actually uh, look uh, for what the government will do after January 5th. I think they will wait for a while, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, they will continue uh, pressing uh, the government and also the opposition to come to a dialogue so that uh, the next election is held uh, with all the parties uh, participating. Uh, and and uh, Dilara Chowdhury, is, is it at all likely that after these elections, which have been described as a farce by, by the opposition, that um, 
the Prime Minister, and, and one can only assume uh, that it is going to be Sheikh Hasina again, that, that she will, within a relatively short space of time, go for new elections, perhaps under uh, the guidance of a caretaker government, or is that absolutely unlikely to happen? Uh, well, you know, in that case, uh the whole thing, the whole crisis, I'm sure uh, you are aware of how this crisis actually came to this stage. It started about, you know, two years ago uh, when the caretaker system was abolished uh, by uh, through a constitutional amendment by the ruling party and without the consultation uh, with the opposition and without the consultation of the people. Uh, it was done more or less single-handedly the Honorable Prime Minister herself. And that was the beginning of the crisis. And um, uh, um, in the meantime, what has happened in Bangladesh? I mean, this is not a new phenomena. It also happened in the past. The ruling party actually engineered uh, uh, the whole election, electoral process. And as a result, uh, what is happening on the 5th of January is a, is a selection of our representatives in the name of election. 57% uh, of the population of Bangladesh have been already disfranchised. Uh, we have 57% have not been able to exercise their right to vote. And the rest of the population, among the rest of the population, my observation is that the turnout is going to be very low. Uh, and indeed, we, we've seen that. We've of, seen that in, in uh, many uh, reports uh, about uh, what's happening. Security forces. Uh, I just want um, to ask Kailash Budwa, and I apologise for talking over you. I, I know there's a delay between me talking and you hearing what I'm saying. It, it is the only way we can communicate. Um, Kailash, let me sure. ask you: um, Is there any way that the political parties? The main political parties will come together and find a way of preventing the kind of violence that has characterized the last two years uh, that Dilara was saying. It was when it, the modern crisis actually began. Right. Let me, let me first take the question of caretaker government, which is the sticking point at the moment between the two main parties. Now, this caretaker government was a very unique kind of solution found to keep the army away. Because in 2007, when the government was, of course, dissolved, and there was a question of new elections, and nobody could come to terms, as the present situation shows, at that time, the military intervened. And the military decided that there should be a caretaker government. Yep. And their caretaker government... I'm going to have to military rush you here a little bit, because we're coming very close to the sure. end. Do you have any formula for the two parties coming together um, to keep the situation as calm as is possible in these circumstances? I would say no other force, no other outside nation, no other kind of power can influence the future of Bangladesh. It's the people of Bangladesh who have to decide. And the only place they can decide is the voting forum. And therefore, I can only wish that politicians would come to their senses. Politicians should decide that this particular option is open. Ask the people, let the people decide who should govern them. And that would be the future of Bangladesh, where they can settle it. Instead of going on the streets, instead of demonstrating, instead of boycotts, instead of accusing each other, here is an opportunity to go to the polls. Here is an opportunity to ask the people. And why not? Let them decide who should govern Bangladesh. Well, Kailash, uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, some form of democracy rather than no form of democracy seems to be the message um, is the best way forward and that the political parties should actually get together and talk about doing the best they can for the people of Bangladesh. Well, we appreciate uh, the fact that you've taken part. That's Dilara Chowdhury. Kailash Budwa and Imtiaz Ahmed. Uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you thank want you. to send us your thoughts, uh, just email them to us at Inside Story at Al Jazeera.net. Inside Story at Al Jazeera.net. Me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.